Uh, welcome to Delhi Daily. I am S. Gopalakrishnan. Uh, this is uh, the second in the conversation series that Delhi Daily is doing with uh, RE Archives in connection with the uh, ongoing exhibition, multidisciplinary art project in Matanjiri. Uh, see a boiling vessel in Malayalam, it is Kadal Tilakina Chembu. And then we are going And uh, this uh, art exhibition is happening. Uh, in Hale Gua, this ancient uh, Jew house in uh, the Jew town in Matanjedi. And uh, today, the, the subject which Dili Dali is going to talk is uh, how uh, human history can be read uh, by taking the ocean as a medium, sea as a medium. And uh, uh, the exhibition as such is related to the oceanic studies and the art expressions through the oceanic perspectives and all. Therefore, uh, we have uh, Professor Dilip Menon as the guest today in Dili Dali um, for talking about this subject. And uh, he is uh, a very noted historian, uh, worldwide uh, known historian. And at the moment, he is uh, the history professor in uh, Johannesburg's Witwatersrand uh, University and uh, uh, welcome to Delhi Daily Professor Dilip Pen. Thank you. And, uh, how, how do you think, how do you see this, uh, this exhibition in Kochi is related to how it is going to contribute the wisdom, the knowledge area of this particular area where you are working uh, these days? See, I think one of the things that uh, historians and social scientists tend to do is that they tend to work with histories of the land, what are called terrestrial histories. Yes. They look at agriculture, they look at states, they look at monarchs, they look at peasants. And very often what is forgotten is that at the edge of their lives and intermingled with their lives is always the ocean. So we cannot think about agriculture in the Indo-Gangetic plain without the vast numbers of labor that have gone out as indentured labor from the same areas to work in South Africa, Fiji, and so on and so forth. The second thing to think about is that uh, while we are, as Malayalis, we eat a lot of fish, we never really ask ourselves the question about uh, in what other ways the ocean figures in our lives. And the, uh, the idea of the sea, a boiling vessel, reminds us that because we are perched on the ocean, right? And in one sense, our myths tell us that our land was recovered from the ocean by Parashurama. And that land could very well be taken back by the ocean, right? We have seen how the floods over the last two years, as a result of our uh, destructive engagement with the environment, have resulted in water entering our very homes, so that we are standing in our homes with water up to our necks. Okay. So we are reminded that the sea, water, these are elements that are constantly present in our life, which we can only ignore at our peril. And so when we think about this uh, exhibition that has been organized by Riaz and others at the Uru Art Harbor and at Haligwa, the important thing to think about is that there are people for whom the ocean is part of their lives. And when the ocean is part of their lives, they also have to think with the uncertainty of time, the uncertainty of space, and the uncertainty of history. Many of the photographs that K.R. Sunil uh, took in his book, wonderful, wonderful book and exhibition yes. on the Manjuka, what, what it shows is that these uh, men who are now in their 70s, 80s, and so on, who, who were operating these boats on the Indian Ocean, would enter the sea with no idea of where they could end up. So they had a plan in mind. They had to go from point A to point B, but very often they ended up in point C or point X, or they died somewhere along the way because the sea is a boiling vessel. There are typhoons, there are storms, there are waves, there are winds, and there are ways in which human pride, human hubris, does not stand very much of a chance against this. So what I think this exhibition reminds us, and I'll stop here, what this exhibition reminds us is to think very carefully about the way in which we situate ourselves as humans against nature, 
in control of nature, dominating over nature, little realizing that the sea is a boiling vessel, yes. that at any point the sea can reclaim what we have so proudly made as history. Yes. You know, uh, uh, this morning I was just thinking about how this uh, climate ch change is uh, uh, influencing the world literature as such, or yes, uh, yes. the art in the world as such. And in Kerala, what I have noticed, though the poetry reflects the fiction so far, uh, you, you know, so far is not that you know evidently influenced by these climatic changes. Uh, mm -hmm. But when it comes to the art, uh, it is such a great thing that uh, Riaz and group are doing. Uh, they right. taking uh, taking the topic at a very 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 important uh, juncture, the time uh, which we have decided to have this exhibition and right. uh, titled as "See a Boiling Wizard." And uh, to my understanding, on second of January, you are giving a talk, and the title which you have given is uh, "The Sea." a history really beginning uh, and uh, i think it is uh, some some way connected to derrick walcott uh, uh, poetry uh, okay yeah why why you think that uh, it is uh, history in a beginning that means uh, you are unlearning certain things yes i think that is what we've had to do uh, or that is what we need to do in, the, in an era where global warming always sits at the edge of our imagination but doesn't occupy us as, as fully as the nuclear threat did in the 1980s. In the 1980s, most of us were more convinced that the world would end as a result of uh, the nuclear explosions of the Cold War and so on, all resulting from the Cold War. But here, I think the important thing to think about is what Amitav Ghosh has called the great derangement. That there is, uh, if he were, to, if uh, people 50 years from now were to look back on the literature that we have produced, and this, as you rightly pointed out, that whether it's it's not only Malayalam that's culpable. I mean, the most regional literatures have been concerned, not been concerned with this phenomenon of the globe, right? In the sense of the globe as enactment of nature upon people, because we do have, if you think about Malayali liter Malayalam literature, it's very cosmopolitan. Mm -hmm. So you have Binyamin's work, for example, where people are migrating to the Gulf. You have K.R. Mira's novels, which are set in Calcutta. Calcutta. You have uh, Perimbalan's novels. We have, we have Anand, we have Anand. Ne never in Kerala. Yeah, Anand never in Kerala. Vilasini setting his uh, novels in Malaysia. So while there is this cosmopolitan outlook, it's always based on conscious human agency, that humans travel because they want to, because they need to. But what global warming is reminding us of, and what artists are reminding us of, is the fact that there are forces beyond our control. So when we think about the fact that uh, the world is composed of migration, right? one kind of migration we recognize, that the migration arising out of the wars in Sri Lanka in the 1980s, the ongoing wars in the Middle East, Syria, Yemen, and so on, from the early 2000s. But what we do not recognize, and which will become a force that we have to recognize, is that the next big migrations that are going to happen are as a result of global warming and the sinking of spaces. As we are, know that Jakarta, the capital yes. of Indonesia, is I'm sinking. Going to say yeah, Bombay, Chennai, Calcutta endangered. And this is not only a phenomenon of the global south. Uh, Florida, New Orleans, uh, a number of spaces all over the world. Are I, I remember the oh, I remember you know, often uh, quoted OVVGN line, you know, this uh -huh. is the way the state is going to wither away. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, actually, it's not only the state. There's going to be a larger withering away of the what we see as the proud achievements of civilization, yes. as the water claims uh, the uh, land, and large numbers of people are now going to have to move as a result of the shift in their ecologies. This is what Amitav Ghosh in Gun Island, in his novel Gun Island, shows, yes. where there's the presence of people from Bangladesh and Venice, for example, right? People who have moved as a result of the ecological devastation caused by the rising waters, and they are cut adrift. 
So I think this is an important thing that literature needs to recognize this. Artists have begun to recognize this conceptually. Right? There are a whole range of artists that one could think about who have spoke, addressed this question of global warming, the melting of the ice caps, the fact that we are 30% land amid 70% water right, on the globe. And suddenly, the simple fact, which we study in uh, grade three or grade four, is beginning to assume huge importance. No, I, I'm just reading a small portion from uh, one of your uh, articles. The world is not a continuous space, and uh, that what we know as history is the emergence and disappearance of connections across time and space. Uh, uh, you know, just for the Malayali audience, I am just translating into Malayalam. Logam uh, urutudar ida malla. Nam charitra men nari inada sthalaga alengalu lula nanakkunna benthangalu de varavum manju pogalu mana ena. Now, my question is whether it is just like the waves uh, emerges and disappears. Yes, I, I think that's a, a wonderful way of putting it because uh, when we stand by the sea and we look at the waves, we lose track because the waves seem to be continuous. We stop looking and distinguishing between the waves, but these waves come and go, come and go. And that rhythm seems to reassure us in our understanding that there is a continuity. Right? That there is a continuity in history, continuity in time, repetition is important. But if we look at history, that's not the way things work. So the examples that I chose in my essay are, is one of the most wonderful examples where we are familiar with Columbus traveling and discovering America. We are familiar with what are called the great voyages of discovery. Uh, Vasco da Gama, aided by Abdul Majid, who finds his way to uh, uh, India and so on. But what we have forgotten is that there were this great era of voyages in the 14th and 15th centuries led by the great Chinese admiral, Zheng He, who mapped the Indian Ocean and moved all the way to Africa. Then the Chinese empire decides that they shall no longer engage with the sea. And that's that. The Chinese never go to sea again for 500 years. And because they didn't do that, we have forgotten that the Chinese were alongside the Arabs or the first great explorers of the sea. And again, when we think about the fact of the kind of divisions that have come about in our mind because of nation states, right? and the World Cup has just got over and we all cheered for Argentina, I hope, to win. And there were multiple countries and so on. But when we go back to the origins of human beings in Africa, for example, and that the first human beings made their way across land and water as far as Polynesia, right? They settled in Asia, in Oceania, and so on. So we have forgotten this great movement, which means that our world is constituted through a huge genetic mix-up, right? And these distinctions into races, nations, all of this is really of very, very immediate historical uh, temporality. So I think the important thing, as you pointed out, and as you, the important phrase that you picked up from the essay is to emphasize discontinuities Forgetfulness, that all of history is not about remembering. History is constituted through amnesia. History is made up through what we forget rather than what we remember. Now, when, you, when we talk about the, you know, the waves in an ocean and how it is related and all, how as you beautifully, uh, would, would be, uh, for, because of the rhythm and the continuity, we uh, sometimes lose the track. Now, I, uh, all of a sudden, I uh, reminded of Narayana Guru line where he said that uh, it is Tarangam Jalatin in Vanyam Allah. The wave is a part of the entire waterscape. And uh, wave, without, the, without the wave, the waterscape is not there. And without, without the waterscape, the wave is also not there. Therefore, it is just a part of the entire waterscape. This is what Guru who mostly was sitting on that ocean side uh, wrote. Okay. And uh, now uh, my next question is, you say that you know, uh, 
to understand to understand the human history the understand history of the world to understand the social sciences and to understand even the literature um, the ocean can be a central point to understand now my question is uh, how will you read the history of art as we are talking about the exhibition in kochi i am asking how will you see the history of art uh, in in this perspective as you know the ocean as the center central point now see one of the things that you already talked about is the fact that more and more artists are beginning to engage with the fact that of global warming and of the ocean being central to our existence that the, the arctic is actually just outside our doorstep in kerala right that once the global uh, you know once the arctic ice caps melt the waters outside or beside kerala are going to rise up so there's that intimate connection and distance no longer makes sense so i think what the sea of boiling vessel uh, does and what artists uh, are have been trying to do is very significant in the sense that they are trying to create an imagination for us which unsettles us see we are in some sense most of our metaphors of being as humans are connected with think terra firma right we are about rootedness about consolidation you know of identities and of history so the i think the uh, central thing here is that uh, uh, the idea of the boiling vessel is actually to remind us as that terra firma that our feet are no longer on firm ground and in many ways our feet are not on firm ground because the waves are lapping at our feet our feet are not firm ground because we are constantly being forced to move right despite the fact of our being settled in one part of the world for seemingly forever but all of this could change if you think about the political theory the ideas of nation state with clearly drawn borders the idea of citizenship with belonging that you are a citizen of india and you belong here and we make these distinctions between refugees and migrants and so on all of this is going to telachi mariyo ella ingane telachi mariyana po like there's a new history that's emerging and that is what uh, i think this metaphor this uh, phrase that was used by one of the manjukars of the sea as a boiling vessel is so profound and powerful because it actually alerts us to what we have forgotten yes we have forgotten that we our lives are very fragile that our lives are very unstable that at any moment right things could Now, change you know, uh, the theme the theme itself uh, for this uh, sea a boiling vessel release um you know from a terrestrial imagination to a maritime uh, imagination you know my question is uh, whether these are two poles uh, whether we can divide it as you know like that it is totally different and no. no i completely agree with you that we cannot we should not but we have right mm-hmm. we have mm-hmm. done this and that's the result of the ways in which our social science to begin with our, our social science imagination and our political imagination has been governed by law and by rulers by empires etc 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 but this is not a binary right of land and water okay which is why a lot of uh, social scientists have begun to speak about the terra aqueous imagination an imagination that brings together land and water the think about Kerala I mean think about our fundamental history think about the fact of parashurama the story of parashurama which is prevalent all the way from kanyakumari through to gujarat along through goa maharashtra and so on think about the stories in tamil nadu of kumari kandam you know the land that was lost so in many many instances we have to stop thinking with this difference between land and water because this has always been fluid right and this fluidity of movement is we are distracted from this fluidity of movement because of the way in which the history of kerala has been written which looks at the temple the king and the land right it's a chatriya and the brahman who played a major role in our imagination and it's also a very hindu imagination yes once we begin to think about the jews the christians the muslims who come from across the ocean 
which have made Kerala what it is as a state, yes. then we are reminded that the ocean cannot be separated from us. Very often when you look at a lot of the histories, particularly the Marxist histories of Kerala, the sea is absent. You would imagine that Kerala was like Hungary, a landlocked you know, space. But there is this constant fluidity between land and water. And it's actually so it's this distinction does not exist in actual life. This, this distinction is a result of political and social processes which have created a way of thinking yes. where we excise it. And if you think about it, and you're very well aware, we've had these conversations earlier as well. You look at the 1980s cinema. When we think about the 1980s cinema in, uh, in Malayalam, which produced Mohanlal as one of our great actors yes. and some great plot lines, that wave in Malayalam cinema was happened as a result of the money coming in from the Gulf, which allowed the independence from the Tamil cinema industry. But all of that cinema was actually militating against the presence of the Gulf. So you have a lot of these stories which recur of Sheikh in the Tarawad, uh, yeah. of the fact that there are these upstart Muslims who come and buy land and so on and so forth. So the 80 cinema is a product of the ocean, but denies the ocean. Okay? <laughs> See, and, that, and that's the paradox at the heart of it. And I think this is what we have to think about, that the ocean is always present. Even on the history of monarchy in Canada, right? yes. that, you know, the monarch who left for Mecca, we tend to associate monarchy with land, temples, and so on and so forth. A large number of the monarchs that we know of right, were in Kerala, were people who were skimming off the profits of the ocean. They were kings along the coast. Think about the Samudri. And if you really think about the uh, Samudri Raja, as he was called, he was the yes. lord of the waves. He was not yes. the lord of the interland. He was not the lord of the inside. And so there is this thin strip of land along the coast where the king sat looking out to sea, making profits through merchants, trade, and so on. And that history is something that we need to readdress. Once we begin to address the history of the ocean, then we also begin to address the history of Kerala in a more whole manner, whole which manner. brings in the history of the Muslim, Christian, the Jewish people, as well as the fisher people who have always been abandoned. Yes. So just to say that there's one novel called Chemin is not sufficient. We need to engage with the ocean. You know, I, was, you know, I, was going to, I was going to say the same thing. You know, I, I read that you mentioned about uh, how M.T. Vasudevan Nair, you know, narrowed the vision. And uh, yes. you know, I was reading, you know, vis-a-vis Anand and all, you said, you know, when, when right. we take writers Anand, Vilasini and all, uh, how... <clears throat> how limited uh, MT's uh, views and you related even Adu with that, uh, if I am right. right. Uh, but then yes. my question is, you know, uh, how do you place this phenomenal writer like Tagali? Mm -hmm. mm, see, Tagali you... in Chemin uh, was really writing within a certain kind of paradigm that included people like P. Keshavadev and so on. Mm. As you know, the Purugamana yes. side. Yes. So trying to bring in characters who are on the margins. But it's interesting that Tagari was the only person who sought to bring in the Fisher people, who have always remained on the margins of the Malayali imagination. Uh, I, I know. So the thing to think about here is that when you think about Tagari's novel, Kaira, Oh. Kaira is a magnificent novel which brings the global back into the history of Kerala. That you cannot think about Kerala as a just Tirudangur Kochi Malabar or Kerala as a part of the Madras presidency and so on. It it actually through one commodity that is Kaira, oh. hmm. it brings in the war. It brings in now you know, and we are getting into the. Uh, uh, last question of our conversation um, right recently recently i read uh, what our uh, you know the paul sakaria has uh, said in a speech uh, where he was telling that um, throughout the uh, the history of kerala uh, the three major religions uh, lived 
together and you know they coexisted and they built kerala because of the understanding unlike other parts of the country and all but now this is for the first time in the history of kerala all the three religions are mm -hmm. trying to get isolated and are trying to uh, define a new kerala which will be which is going to be a very very dangerous trend he mentioned very recently how will you relate to that see i think there is uh, one way in which you can both be sentimental as well as complacent about the fact that kerala has a syncretistic culture we get along you know hindu muslim christian we are all and so on and so forth but it's important to understand that this kind of harmony between religions has always been based on what ashish nandi called prejudices about the other community so it's not uh, so it's not to say that in kerala that you have the, probably if you were to think about kerala as a composite society we should be able to say that kerala has the highest number of inter religious and inter caste marriages this is not true right that kerala in that sense is very similar to the rest of india in many ways and there were is ways in which the emerging paradigm of hindu nationalism has been pushing kerala in a particular direction as well so when we saw that with the shavari mala agitation we saw that in various instances but i think more important than this the change when it happens will happen suddenly it will not happen gradually so if you think about the fact of the kerala economy and the state that it is in we are a remittance economy we are based on the export of labor to the gulf now let us imagine a scenario in which you have the gulf closed off to employment from kerala and all of them return they will return a lot of them and this is something we know from everyday conversation a lot of them will return with the kinds of prejudices that will align them with hindu nationalism in india they will have had the experience of living in a muslim country and what you're going to see is that if that source of employment dries up suddenly the change in kerala will be frightening and quick we shall probably see the resurgence of a certain form yes uh hindu nationalism a landed imagination its next edition as it were yes okay uh, uh i will be there to uh, uh, hear you on 2nd of january most probably and uh, oh, thank you thank you uh, so uh, okay i'm thankful to you for your quality time i know you are traveling but you found uh, 30 40 minutes for us uh, then uh, i am hopeful that this exhibition which uh, which is happening there ca boiling vessel uh, will uh, will have the deserving uh, recognition in kerala society and we, so, so far yes. what i i came to know that there is a huge crowd uh, visiting the Uh, by exhibition and uh, once again i am uh, thanking you on behalf of the listeners of delhi delhi thank you for your quality time thank you thank you abhishek thank you for making the time to interview me it's been a pleasure talking with you thank you thank you okay bye bye